Welcome to Term Talk, an FJC program designed to discuss uh, in brief those issues and Supreme Court decisions of most importance to federal judges. I'm Jim Chance, and we're pleased to have with us two terrific constitutional law scholars to discuss these cases with us. From New York University Law School, we're pleased to welcome the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law and Faculty Director of Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network, Professor Melissa Murray. Welcome. And once again, we welcome back the Dean and Jesse H. Choper, Distinguished Professor of Law at UC Berkeley Law, Erwin Chemerinsky. How are you? Thank you. Our thanks to you both. Uh, Erwin, let's start with you. The June medical case concerns restrictions to a woman's freedom to abortion. Um, the facts in this case are similar to one the court uh, handled a Texas case about four years ago, where it rejected almost identical restrictions. Can you tell us about the facts in the June medical case and what, if anything, distinguishes it from the Whole Woman's Health case back in 2016? Of course, Whole Woman's Health involved a Texas law imposing restrictions on abortion. One part of that law said that in order for a doctor to perform an abortion, the doctor had to have admitting privilege to the hospital within 30 miles. The Supreme Court in Whole Woman's Health 5 to 3 declared that unconstitutional. Justice Breyer wrote the opinion for the court, joined by Justices Kennedy, Ginsburg, Sonner, and Kagan. Justice Breyer said in deciding what's an undue burden on access to abortion, it's important to balance the impediments to access to abortion created by the law as opposed to the benefits with regard to protecting women's health. Justice Breyer said that the Texas law would create significant impediments of access to abortion closing many of the facilities in the state where abortion performed. But he said there were no benefits that could be identified in terms of women's health. Really, do women having abortions need to be hospitalized? If they are to be hospitalized, doctors at those hospitals provide treatment. There's no need for admitting privileges. Many states had adopted laws like the Texas statute. Federal district courts throughout the country struck those laws down. Louisiana was one of the states that adopted a law like the Texas statute. In fact, the Louisiana law was identical to the Texas law. Louisiana had copied the Texas law. The federal district court in Baton Rouge declared the Louisiana law unconstitutional based on whole women's health. The Fifth Circuit, though, in a two to one decision reversed and said that the factual record with regard to the Texas law in terms of the impediments of access to abortion hadn't been shown to the same extent with regard to the Louisiana law. So, Melissa, what were the issues before the court in June medical, and how did the court rule? There were two issues before the court. The first was a jurisdictional issue, a standing issue, and the question there was whether the challengers, which were the abortion providers and clinics, had standing to sue on behalf of their patients. And that question actually was one that was surfaced by Justice Thomas in his dissent to the majority opinion in Whole Women's Health back in 2016. The majority here in June Medical Services dealt very quickly with this question, concluding that Louisiana had waived the issue below, um, but noted that even if the issue was available for review, there was ample Supreme Court precedent making clear that doctors could challenge the law on behalf of their patients. The second issue was the substantive question, whether the Louisiana admitting privileges law imposed an undue burden in violation of the Constitution. And there we had two opinions from the court. The first was a plurality opinion written by Justice Breyer and joined by Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and Ginsburg, where Justice Breyer weighed the law's purported interest in securing and promoting women's health against its impact in narrowing abortion access throughout Louisiana. And in doing this, he essentially reiterated the analysis he had deployed in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, including deferring to the district court's fact-finding. He noted that the admitting privileges law offered no pronounced benefits to women's health, but posed an undue impact on abortion access, including limiting the number of clinics in the state of Louisiana to one. And he concluded that it posed an undue burden. Chief Justice Roberts, who was the pivotal fifth vote in this case, joined the judgment, but did not sign on to Breyer's opinion. As he explained in his solo concurrence, he had dissented in whole women's health, and he still believed that the challenge law there should have been upheld. Nevertheless, because that Texas law had been invalidated by a majority of the court and because the Louisiana law was virtually identical to it, he said that stare decisis compelled the outcome. 
That said, he didn't agree with Justice Breyer that the proper analysis was the weighing of benefits against burdens, as Whole Women's Health had prescribed. And instead, he read Whole Women's Health to require no more than the standard articulated in 1992's Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania against Casey, in which the court made clear that the laws that had the purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion was unconstitutional. So in this case, Roberts maintained, the proper test was the Casey Substantial Obstacle Test, which Louisiana had failed. But Melissa, in nearly 150 pages of this decision, uh, including the opinion and the chief's concurrence and a, a multiple dissenting opinions, there was no clear plurality. So what was actually decided here and, and how did the justices differ? So it's a terrific question. Um, the rule laid out in Marx versus United States explains that when a fragmented court decides a case and there's no single rationale explaining the result that enjoys the assent of five justices, the holding of the court should be viewed as the position taken by the members who concurred in the judgment on the narrowest grounds, which would suggest that Chief, Just Chief Justice Roberts' concurrence, which is the narrowest grounds for decision, would control here. But this is where it gets dicier. What exactly does that concurrence hold? So there were very definitely five votes to strike down the Louisiana law, but unclear whether there are five votes for the chief's position that the benefits and burdens balancing test articulated in Whole Women's Health was not the appropriate test to use. So that really is the question going forward here. Is it the case that Chief Justice Roberts and the dissenters who believe that the test should be thrown out have actually prevailed? Or is it the case that there is no clear five person majority to conclude that whole women's test has been gutted? So what impact is this gonna have on the lower court judges, the federal court judges who will be watching this uh, going forward? What are their takeaways? Well, I think one of the things here is that there's going to have to be really extensive fact finding, certainly at the district court level when these abortion laws are challenged. So here, Justice Breyer relied extensively on the district court's ruling. And a lot of that was, again, taken straight from the whole women's health playbook. So that will continue to be important here. Fact finding will be key. Um, the question as to whether or not the substantial obstacle test or the benefits and burdens balancing test will prevail. Again, I think that's a harder call. And I think that's likely something that we'll see more litigation on from the lower federal courts going forward. I agree with Melissa. I think the lower courts are going to have to decide whether or not to use the balancing test of the plurality or the undue burden test in Chief Justice Roberts. There's also the question of how different are they in practice? Because is it possible to decide what's an undue burden without weighing the benefits and the burdens of the law, as Justice Breyer says? Okay, Erwin, let's look, turn to the Little Sisters versus Pennsylvania case. Uh, it's been characterized by some as a religious freedom case, like uh, Burwell versus Hobby Lobby back in 2014. But this one goes beyond religious freedom, doesn't it? This case was not decided by the Supreme Court as a religious freedom case, though certainly that's an issue that lurks in the background. To go start, the Affordable Care Act says that part of what employers must provide in their health insurance for employees is preventative health care coverage. The Obama administration developed rules that said that the preventative health care coverage that must be provided by employers and insurance has to include contraceptive coverage for women. The Obama administration had some exceptions for those who had religious objections to providing contraceptives. In the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby case, which you mentioned from 2014, said that under the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, at least the owners of a family-held business have a right to not provide such contraceptive coverage if it violates the owner's religious beliefs. The Trump administration took a very different approach in its regulations and said that any employer who has a conscience or a religious objection to contraceptives doesn't have to provide such insurance coverage. And the issue before the Supreme Court was whether or not this regulation was consistent with the Affordable Care Act. The Supreme Court, seven to two, in an opinion by Justice Thomas, said that this is consistent with the Affordable Care Act. But Justice Kagan, in a concurring opinion, said it still might be challenged as violating the Administrative Procedures Act for being arbitrary and capricious. And there's still the issue of employers who object to providing contraceptives on religious grounds 
trying to say that it would violate the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So as I said, Jim, the court's holding is very narrow, just saying that this regulation doesn't violate the Affordable Care Act. All of the other issues are left open. I see. Well, let me ask you, Melissa, what, what are the takeaways going forward for, these, for the judges who will be listening to this about the Little Sisters case? Well, to be sure, the question of whether or not the rules uh, violated the Administrative Procedures Act will continue to be a live issue in the lower courts. And Justice Kagan's um, opinion here will certainly be a roadmap for lower courts in trying to deal with that. Again, the question of what impact RIPRA has on any of these challenges is also an open question, and that's one that we'll see litigated again at the lower federal courts. And I think the whole question of whether or not we're going to see more of these religious freedom cases intersecting with questions of equality, of course, is going to happen more and more. We already have another case that's going to be heard by the court in this upcoming term. Um, this is City of Philadelphia versus Fulton where we're going to again be faced with this confrontation between liberty on the one hand and equality on the other. And this case looks at administrative rules set forth by first the Obama administration and then the Trump administration and how these administrations uh, handled the issue of contraception differently. So uh, could this whole fact situation change again in a year or two? Well, depending on the outcome of the election, we can certainly see perhaps some movement in the question of the rules and what sorts of exemptions are required and in what circumstances. I very much agree with Melissa. It's important to keep in mind that what Hobby Lobby was about was whether or not religions could claim an exception from a contraceptive mandate under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. What the Little Sisters of Poor case up this term is whether or not a federal regulation broadening the exception for religion and conscience is permissible. So they're quite different in terms of their procedural posture. Great, I appreciate this. Uh, thanks to both of you, uh, Berkeley's Law, uh, Berkeley Law's Dean Erwin Chemerinsky, NYU Law's Professor Melissa Murray. We appreciate you joining us. It is always a pleasure.